For a long time now, it's been usual to see Western philosophy in the 17th and 18th centuries as divided between two opposing schools, British empiricism and continental rationalism, the chief of the empiricists being Locke, Berkeley and Hume, and the chief of the rationalists being Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz. Of the many issues that divided them, the most important, put at its crudest, was this. The rationalists believe that we human beings can acquire important knowledge of reality by the use of our minds alone, by thinking, by pure reason. The empiricists denied this. They insisted that experience was always a necessary ingredient and that all our knowledge of what actually exists must in the end, in some way or other, be derived from experience. Again, the traditional view has been that these two opposing schools finally came together at the end of the 18th century and were combined in the work of Immanuel Kant. In this program, we're going to take a look at Spinoza and Leibniz, the two greatest of the rationalist philosophers after Descartes. The first in time was Spinoza, born in Amsterdam in 1632. His family were Portuguese Jews who, in the aftermath of the Spanish Inquisition, emigrated to Holland in search of religious freedom. Spinoza was brought up and educated in an enclosed Jewish community. But he rebelled against religious orthodoxy, and at the age of only 24, he was excommunicated by the Jewish authorities. Fortunately for him, he was a loner by temperament as well as circumstances, and he chose a solitary mode of life in order to do his work. When he was offered a professorship at Heidelberg University, he turned it down. He earned his living grinding lenses for spectacles, microscopes, and telescopes. And it's believed that the daily inhaling of glass dust from this occupation aggravated the lung ailment that killed him at the early age of 44. His acknowledged masterpiece, a book entitled Ethics, but in fact dealing with the whole range of philosophy, came out after his death, but in the same year, 1677. A striking feature of this book is that it's modelled directly on Euclid's Euclid geometry, Starting from a small number of axioms and primitive terms, it proceeds by deductive logic to prove a long succession of numbered propositions which, taken together, lay out the total scheme of reality. It's often held up as the supreme example of a self-contained metaphysical system whose object is to explain everything. In only the year before his death, Spinoza had a series of meetings with the other philosopher we're going to consider, Leibniz one of comparatively few instances of two of the greatest philosophers actually meeting each other and having face-to-face -face discussions. As a personality, Leibniz was a complete contrast to Spinoza, courtier and diplomat, always traveling, honored in many countries. He was one of the great polymaths of our culture. It was he who coined the notion of kinetic energy. He invented calculus, not knowing that Newton had already done so, and published it before Newton did. In fact, it's his notation, not Newton's, that we use to this day. And he was among the great philosophers. Leibniz was born in Leipzig in 1646 and died in Hanover at the age of 70 in the year 1716. <coughs> so brilliant was he as a student that he was offered a professorship at the age of 21. But, like Spinoza, he turned it down, though for the opposite reason. He wanted to be a man of the world. He spent most of his life at the court of Hanover, in the service of successive dukes, one of whom became King George I of England, founder of the present British royal family. Leibniz carried out almost every task imaginable for a person in such a position, and his philosophy was, as one might put it, written in his spare time. He wrote an enormous amount, mostly in the form of quite short papers, but published scarcely any of it during his life. He also maintained a voluminous international correspondence, which is now of philosophical importance. Among his outstanding works are The Monadology, The Discourse on Metaphysics, and a book called New Essays Concerning Human Understanding, which is a point-by-point -point argument with his English near-contemporary John Locke. To discuss the work of Leibniz and Spinoza, I've invited someone who is well known both as a philosopher and as a historian of philosophy. Anthony Quinton, chairman of the British Library, formerly president of Trinity College, Oxford. Anthony Quinton, for clarity's sake, I think we're going to have to deal with our two philosophers separately. But before we start doing that, is there anything that can be said usefully about them jointly? Well, I think there is. The one you've mentioned already, it's a standard piece of 
tidy, convenient classification. They're the three rationalists who face the three British empiricists, these two opposed triads of thinkers. Uh, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, they do have a community of style and purpose. Descartes defined the terms, laid down the agenda, but in a sense the world that Descartes produced by the exercise of pure reason or the conception of the world that Descartes produced is a fairly straightforward affair. He does preserve the self in a recognizable form, the human individual. He, in the natural, straightforward terms of his age, produces God, even if it's not a terribly human sort of God. And he preserves the material world in a, broadly speaking, recognizable form, even if deprived of some of its more vivid and colorful and odoriferous attributes. But the worlds created by the application of the procedure of rationalism, the one you mentioned, you start from some self-evident propositions, like a person producing a system of geometry, and then you carry out processes of absolute uh, straightforward deduction from these self-evident propositions. Um, what that led to, in the case of Spinoza and Leibniz, is something very far removed in both of them from the ordinary understanding of the world. To some extent, Descartes, by comparison with them, is in the business of saving the appearances. Uh, Spinoza and Leibniz both say what the world is really like is very different from what it appears to the ordinary person to be. That in both cases there is an underlying reality which philosophy can tell us about even if common observation doesn't. That's right. And no? a very odd uh, world it is in each case. I mean, just to state in very brief terms what it is there in each of them. Uh, it's so utterly opposed in the two cases, yet they purport to be following the same procedure and under what one might call broadly Cartesian guidance. Uh, Spidoza's world is a unitary world. It, the, there is only one true thing, which is the world as a whole, which is both extended and, in some sense, mental, a, a system of ideas. On the other hand, in Leibniz's case, the real world consists of an infinity of things that are purely spiritual, and everything material and space itself are phenomena, appearances, byproducts, as it were, of the real world, which is this infinite array of spiritual centers. Right, well now let's start taking them one by one and let's begin with Spinoza. It is this enormously elaborated single system and it's often difficult to know where to break into a system where one, when one wants to start expanding it. Where do you think is the best place to start? Well, there are a number of places you could begin. I think one had better say just a bit more about Spinoza's method because he himself says that this book, Ethics, is demonstrated in the geometrical manner. And as you mentioned in your remarks at the beginning, he does set it out with all the familiar apparatus of geometry, things called axioms and postulates and definitions, and the end of each bit of argument uh, find is, has the letters QED, yeah. as, as if yeah. it were a straight piece of geometrical yeah. reasoning. Funny thing is that on the whole, Subsequent philosophers haven't taken Spinoza's reasonings frightfully seriously. People don't think of him as a reservoir of interesting arguments, whereas they do think that of Leibniz. Anyway, so perhaps the method, although it's the most obvious feature, this very explicit and conscious geometrical method is the real stylistically obvious feature of Spinoza's work, it's not what's really important, which is, I suppose one must say, a vision. And this vision is of the, the world as an absolutely... Uh, unitary entity, any division of which is a mutilation of some sort of misunderstanding. 